So I want to go back to the basics on, uh, and, and don't want to spend too much time on this one, but I would like to really go back to understanding the basics of C++ just to create a common baseline. And uh, one important topic is types and values in C++. In C++. So uh, you probably have heard several times C++ is a strongly typed language. Uh, what does that mean? So in many languages like Python, you can write x equal hello and then the next sentence x equal 10. And uh, then you may ask what is x? Is it a string or is, or is it an integer? In C++, after a symbol is defined in a certain scope, it has a certain type and that is its type. It cannot be changed. Right? And this is super, super important for safety, for the um, for always knowing that you cannot do, uh, you, can, you cannot change the things underneath the, the covers. If, if something is an integer, it's gonna be an integer in that scope. There's no other, other option. Uh, so sometimes the types can be extremely difficult uh, to handle. Um, and for this reason, there is a keyword auto in Z++ that allows you for in many cases to not even think about the type of a certain object, but the type is always used at, at the, when you declare the symbol, when you define that symbol, that is the only place where you put auto. So once the type is, it has been decided for that symbol, that, that's it, that, that, that's the type of that symbol in, the, in that scope. What are the types that you find in C++? There are different ways of categorizing types in C++. There are the fundamental types like the arithmetic uh, and void and null pointer T. And there are compound types. The compound types, the most typical thing when you think about compound type is basically classes and uh, and uh, and the unions uh, compound type means you know a type made of different things so yeah that this is what the class is uh, but then also function can be seen as a compound type an array is compound types at pointers and pointed to members the references are also compound types and and enumerations uh, almost all these types can be constant, volatile, qualified, and uh, we will go into, into the, we will see the const, we will not talk about the volatile keyword here, here. Um, but yeah, so this is one first classification of the types, but also what are the different a different way of categorizing types uh, of things that we have in C++. And there are objects, which is basically everything is an object in C++, apart from references, functions, and the void type. So a reference is not an object. This is an important distinction. And also a function is not an object, which means it cannot be passed to other uh, functions as a regular uh, type is this a function point if you can pass a function as a function pointer but not as a uh, not as an object um, then you have the scalar types which are arithmetic pointers and, and no, uh, numerators you have the trivial types which are the the scalar types are trivial they're simple POD and then the aggregates that we'll see later and li li literals. And then there are the incomplete types. And the incomplete types we are types that are not fully formed yet. Like a, temp like a class without the template arguments and, or declarations without definitions. Those are incomplete type, they're not finished yet. Right, that, and this is useful when you see the error uh, in your screen. You compile and you get a compiler that says incomplete type. Well, it means that you know 
For instance, he, he, the compiler found the declaration of the function, but not the, the definition. And this gives you a hint of where to look for the bug. Many of the type uh, uh, types, uh, the types categories that we that we saw before can be checked at compile time. If you include the type traits uh, header, you can check if a type is integral, if it is a, a POD, a plain old data type. You can even check if the types are the same, for instance, uh, if T and U are the same type, then you get the uh, true, otherwise you get false. Uh, I hope you are fam familiar with this column-column uh, uh, no notation, which is used to access uh, uh, type data members of your classes and uh, static, uh, um, static members uh, of those. Uh, we will see this notation everywhere. And of course, it's also used for going into, uh, into name spaces. So there, there are more. You can also check if a class is derived from another class, for instance. At compile time, you can, you can do these checks. Uh, we go also into uh, concepts. So a concept describes the requirements for the types. So if you have a function that, take, that needs a type that you can uh, um, increment, for instance, well, then you can say, I need an incrementable object here. And, and only if the, if the type that comes in, if the argument that comes in is incrementable, then the function can be compiled. Otherwise you get a, a compilation error. And we get into those more later. So in, in, in C++11, we can construct objects with the curly braces or with a typical parenthesis. So before C++11, you are a class A and with the constructor that takes a, an integer and a float, and then you construct it like this. You pass A and then act, and you pass as a function called uh, the argument using the parenthesis. In C11, you can use curly braces for doing that. And most of the time is the same. You can do both, right? In most of the cases. But in many, in some cases, actually, there are some, some dif differences. So for instance, uh, uh, I see who's the first in the chat to, to, to point to, to say what what is the meaning of the of the statement marked with one? Don't see response yet. So while number three, you are default constructing an object of type A, and you call the default constructor, which is over here. With two, you also default constructing the, with the empty braces, but I number one is, is actually not a construction. This is declaring a function name X that takes no argument and returns an object of type A. So when you write this piece of code, number one, you just get a computation error. And this is uh, annoying, but this is how C++ language is, uh, be, has been defined. So basically, the brace in initialization gives you the ability to call the default constructor with, without arguments. Another thing that the brace, uh, the, 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 the brace constructor though, uh, gives you is the it, it doesn't do any conversion for you. So suppose you have a, a class B that takes a char as an argument. And now we have C1 and C2, two chars. And we want to construct the B with the sum of these two chars. Well, this is okay, this works. But if you use the brace initializer, this is a compilation error. 
Does someone know how uh, knows how why this is a compiler? So in, in C++, when you do C1 plus C2, you don't get a char back, you get an integer. And now when I construct the X with, with this integer, it is casted back to a char. So it's basically converted to a char and then I can construct the B. In the brace initialization, I don't have this conversion happening. So C, C1 plus C2 is an integer. When I call the constructor, I say, well, I'm, I'm expecting a char. I'm going to give you an error. So in order to do, to call it, you need to do static cast to char of, of, the, from, of, of the results of this expression. And then it will work. Um, Well, let me, yeah, I don't, uh, let me, I don't want to do this one. I want to go to the pods and aggregates. So pod is called plain old data types. And it's a, it's a class, which is uh, very, very simple. It's just all data members have to be PODs themselves. There should be no references or no virtual functions, nothing. Uh, no user defined constructors or even member initializers. Member initializers is a feature of C11. And, uh, and, and all, the, all the data members should have the same con access control, which means they're all public or they are all private. So in this class here, where you have a class, so int A and float B are actually private. Then you have a, class, a member which is public. This is not a POD class. So you have to remove this uh, public and then and then become POD. And aggregate as an additional requirement that uh, they have to be public, right? So uh, uh, and aggregate as a, as a special constraint, additional constraint. Why I'm talking about these guys? Well, PLTs are useful because they are, they say, compatible with C also. So you can also pass them around quite, quite easily to uh, other languages, for instance. And uh, the aggregates are, are interesting because they can be initialized in a, in a special way which is known, known as the struct initialization. And you use the braces here, right? The braces are not calling a constructor. That's the difference. It's not really calling a constructor. You are initializing the data members of this aggregate. So if I have a struct aggregate with a float A, B, if a integer of A, float B, char C, I can initialize it like this. And this is actually initialized by the compiler uh, in its own way. And, um, and uh, the um, aggregate can be um, composed in the sense you can have an aggregate like, like two arrays here, which has the two arrays as data members, short array of three and short array of five. And these are the two aggregates that uh, are there. So two arrays is actually an aggregate, which has a short array three, short, short array five and index. And, and, and also one interesting feature of this is that you can construct them at compile time. So I can put the keyword const expert here um, and the instantiate two, which is an instance of two arrays with, with these values where the, the first array of three is three to one. The second array is five, is five, four, three to one. And then the integer is three to four. And then I can check at compile time, actually static assert is something you put in your code and will be checked at compile time that the X member of two is actually equal to 324. If you don't specify all of them here, you can say five, four, and that's it. The other will be initialized to zero. 
So in real life, uh, STD array is an, an aggregate. And uh, what you could do is with this array, for instance, is that you can encode into an STD array, um, for instance, compile time bounds, for instance. So if you are concerned that your loop bounds has to be known at, com at compile time, if you want to implement multiple versions of your loop, for instance, based on the, based on the uh, values of your bounds, and you want some of them to be known at compile time, then you could use the STD array to encode them. Uh, and you have also shorter, so, uh, shorter syntaxes like here you can do uh, after C++ 11 that you could only do this syntax here and now you could have more uniform in, in, in initialization. You can say bounds equal three, four, five. This is very handy in many cases and, uh, but you have to also be aware that there are initialized lists. So the, so the syntax that we see here is similar to the syntax that you have with initialized lists. An initialized list allows you to initialize objects with an initial set of values. For instance, uh, I have my class X, which has an uh, initializer list constructor that takes the initializer list of characters. And then I, when I call this, this constructor, I can say X, and then I pass my list of uh, um, chars like this, or I can pass my list of chars like this, and I go like equal, and then this brace in initializer list, and then I would call this constructor. I can then call, I can initialize the vector V with this charge because the STD vector has a initializer list constructor. And I can all, all also call uh, another function that takes something which is a container of chars. And then I can iterate over my initializer list. And for instance, uh, in this case, I've inside my constructor, I'm going to print the values of, uh, of, of this chars. You cannot uh, call directly the function f with, with this uh, syntax here because it doesn't, the C compiler doesn't interpret that for you as an initializer list. So you have to explicitly construct the initializer list, but you probably never need to do this. You just need initializer list to construct objects. Okay, I think that, uh, let me see, no, okay, yeah, the guy's constructor, and then I set this one, and no deduction. Uh, last slide I want to I want to show right now, then we take a little break, and um, when do we need to use the uh, round parentheses and the brace initializer? We've seen there are aggregate constructors, initializer list, or, and, any constructor. So when I do std vector int and I say v104, it's different than when I use the do 104 with the brace in initializer. This become an array, the first one becomes an array of 10 elements initialized to four according to the standard vector uh, public API since forever. But when I do 10-4 with the braces, this goes into the initializer list. So this becomes a vector with two elements. The first is 10 and the second is four. So it is important to know which one you're taking. And, but to, to enable this, they had to make the initializer list to take precedence over the other constructors. So the initializer list, we always go first. Uh, and then well, you have the round definition versus curly construction, just to give you some mental distinction between the, how you define an object or how you construct it. But uh, it, 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 sometimes it can get a little bit uh, complicated and uh, we, you need to know a little bit more about implementation. Let's, uh, let's see another 
another feature which is uh, uh, interesting, I think, because sometimes it, it might be useful. And also to know, it gives you a little bit of a, of a look of how things are actually done for what, what happens in C++, which is the um, <laughs> copy initialization. So when you when you write the type x equal some expression, that what happens there is a conversion constructor. So whatever comes out of that expression is converted to the uh, argument of the constructor for x. And this goes through overload resolution. We will go into over overload resolution uh, next. Uh, in quite some uh, details, but basically you have different versions, different uh, different uh, constructors. For instance, for the for the type for type, and and then you select uh, which one is the best. Well, not you. I mean, the compiler selects the best uh, com version of the constructor based on the type of the expression. Um, it has the same rule as when you pass an argument to a function. So when you pass an argument to a function, if the function doesn't have the same type that you are passing it as argument, but it, the type can be converted, then you know the conversion happens. Um, <laughs> so um, if I have in my code here and the struct. Uh, have a struct B and with a data member A and a constructor that takes an integer. If I say, if I construct B of type B equal 42, well, this integer is passed in in the constructor of B, right? So it's basically this assignment is turned into argument passing to X. Uh, but if I call, if I have a function F that takes an object of type B and does something, then I can call f of with 42. And 42 is an integer, it's not an instance of object B. But then 42 is passed, is you construct x with 42. And now on x, in, you call this constructor, and then you, inside your function, x is initialized with the 42, right? So, and this happens um, automatically. Now, you might want to, um, avoid that, right? You, you might want to say, well, no, I don't want this to happen because I know that my user might get confused or maybe something something is not uh, is not right. It doesn't feel right for my API. So what do you do? Well, you can use the explicit keyword, right? In the, in the constructor. So you say in the constructor of the class, you 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 prepend this explicit keyword, and uh, and then in order to do, if you do b equal forty like the, this one, the same sentence here doesn't work anymore. It is a compiler error. You have to explicitly convert the integer into an instance of class b, and this pass the integer to the constructor, uh, to 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 the constructor arguments. And the same thing when you call a function f. If I want to construct b with 10, I need to do it explicitly. And this gives more uh, con control to, uh, basically it gives, it gives more awareness to, 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 to the user of what's going on. And sometimes you might want to allow this, basically almost every time, but in some cases you want really the user to be aware and to be conscious about what uh, what's happening. So the explicit keyword is uh, can can be used also in other cases. So uh, in this case, for instance, we have put the explicit keywords in the two constructors of A, uh, where uh, with with one of the two arguments, and then explicit also in this operator int. Operator int is a feature that you don't see very often, but it's a conversion operator that basically converts automatically a type A into an integer. For instance, I want that when I convert, when I assign, let's see the destruct B, which has the operator int here, and that 
returns a the, the first integer uh, data member and when i write int i equal y and y is a type of uh, y is an object of type b then it will be it will call in the uh, conversion operator to integer and you get basically i will be equal to a so in this case it will be equal to 34 but if i do explicit in this operator then i i have to explicitly cast the my object of type a in this case my object y i have to explicitly cast it to an integer again this gives you more awareness of what's going on right uh, it is really uh, it, y is not an integer i cannot assign it you can, i have to convert it and by you can convert it you can have complete control on how you convert it with this operator but you're also aware that this conversion is happening so same thing here you can say b equal uh 10 dot 10 dot is a double right so this is a double number when I call a constructor of B, this is converted to an int, and you go into this constructor. <clears throat> if I uh, and if I want to do, um, uh, I can use the equal here to pass these two arguments uh, with a brace in, in initialization. I can call the second constructor that takes two arguments. But when I'm using explicit. I have to explicitly pass it. I either have to convert explicitly this argument to an integer, or I can pass it using the constructor um, a call. So I call explicitly the constructor of X. So you can see the explicit keywords. There's also another point here. When you, when I, if I don't do uh, explicit conversion, and I have a function make b and make b takes two arguments and return look at how the syntax is like the a and b inside braces this is automatically converted to uh, to the arguments to the constructors of b right if i do if i have expl an explicit keyword then what you have is that you have to explicitly construct a with those arguments you cannot do it, you know, uh, um, with, without um, without explicitly mentioning the type. And also here, you have to explicitly say, well, you need to explicitly call the constructor, or you have to explicitly doing state of uh, uh, static static uh, cast. All right, I have a question. Yeah, you can ask the question. So I don't see the chat. Yes, I have okay. to ask the question, sorry. Yeah. Please go ahead. Oh, uh, so you read it in, in, in the chat? You can, or I can just repeat the question for you. Yeah. Yeah. So normally in structs, we don't use destructors like we use in classes. But is it because that struct constructors they automatically get destructed uh, destructed file out of scope? Uh, no. So the distinct in C the distinction between a class and a struct is only because in a struct the the data are members not. are by default public and in yeah. class are by default private private exactly yeah. so that's the only distinction between structs and and, cla and classes um so struct in c++ does not refer to the struct in c right they're they're basically the same thing so if you need a destructor for the class you need it also for for the struct okay does this answer your question yeah, because right now you were just talking about different uh, constructors, like uh, say like uh, struct B has B int uh, and B int int. So uh, I was just thinking, but nowhere you have just uh, uh, used the destructors in uh, for those uh, constructors. 
No, no, no. Uh, it's not uh, related to that. The destructor you need, if the class is owning certain resources that need to be explicitly uh, released. Yeah, no, and for struct also, right? Yeah, for struct also, exactly. That's the own, yeah. Okay. So just, just wanted to make sure that as long as uh, I am using uh, the uh, like stack, I'm fine, right? In, in in this case, you are. Yes. Because this, uh, this class is here, have just two member functions. So this will be allocated on the stack, on the stack yeah. both ways. Yeah, exactly. So but if if you had like some pointer to some memory located uh, piece of memory, uh, uh, then I need a destructor in, in both cases, either it is a class or a struct in uh -huh. order to free that resources when I go out of scope. Yeah, 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 thanks. Yep. So some examples on how to use, uh, why to use explicit. Um, I think it depends really on the, on the, uh, on what you want your, your, your uh, an API to be, right? We said the interfaces should be easy to use correctly and difficult to, to use mistakenly. So if, uh, if this syntax is always fine, uh, then you don't need explicit, right? It would just, you know it's safe. Your user would never do anything weird with these guys. So we'll always understand that the Y is actually type B is not an integer and, and you are fine with it. In some generic code, for instance, you don't know what's coming in your function, and but you have something like this. So you assume that that is always uh, Im implicitly convertible. And in other cases, you might want to have an interface that, that is more, that gives more awareness uh, to the user because there are cases in which you can, the, the user can get confused. All right, uh, I hope that answer your question. Uh, Eva, I hope I pronounce your names right. Uh, if I don't, please let me know. Uh, right, G? Uh, ask uh, when is struct prefer over a class since C++ encourage data encapsulation. Oh, well, that's uh, the, it depends. Uh, <laughs> so structs are not evil. So having public data members is not necessarily bad, right? It depends, it, it depends what you do. And uh, sometimes they yeah, are public data members are fine. Um, sometimes they're not. So in the, in, in the classical object oriented um, programming, you have a class and you would define your data members first and then your constructors and then your member functions. Then you want those data members to be private by default. And, and that's fine. But in other cases, you don't mind having the data, the data members being accessible. For instance, std pair, right? std pair, you have first and second, and they are data members. They're not member functions. They're not get, getter, right? So the, the reasoning is if I have a class and I need to write twice the amount of code to get to do the, to access my data members, um, why shouldn't and then you have like a const version when you read it and, and a non-const version when, when you write it. That's why it don't simply give access to the data members. So this is really a matter of uh, use cases and taste. So en encapsulation is, um, is always a good argument, but then, you know, do you access straight away the, the data members or not? There are many cases in which you actually want to do it. Uh, uh, Mauro, yeah. uh, can I add uh, my comment to? Of course, the, Anton, to please go ahead. Uh, so, uh, 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 so I think that the, the uh, I think that the rule of thumb uh, should be the following: 
if we, you have a structure that uh, uh, if you have uh, that if your data has some constraints on it and you want to uh, hold uh, and you will want to hold those constraints as an invariance you probably want to use classes for example if you if you keep in your data the uh, uh, the file name and the size of it it uh, obviously cannot be the structure because uh, well it's e e e e e e e if you have uh, both members as a as as accessible uh, accessible you can easily uh, uh, ruin the the integrity but uh, 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 and you can for example uh, change the size without uh, the uh, the size uh, member without uh, uh, modifying the, the file yes and if you don't have invariance it's pretty uh, it, it, it's it's safe and even even recommended to use struct uh, uh, instead uh, like in the case of pair or tuple it doesn't make sense to uh, uh, to have uh, uh, to have the mem the getters and setters because any any combination of the data is uh, valid uh, thank you Awesome, Anton. Great answer. This is what I was trying to say, my lengthy answer. So awesome. <laughs> All right, let's go. What's next? Okay. <coughs> Wait. Oh. So um, from C11, you can uh, explicitly declare some constructors and as default which means that it, it, you know the rule is, is in that slide I showed in the first part, where basically if you define, if you have a, a class or, or a struct where you initialize uh, y, uh, you, have, you have a constructor for y which takes an integer, the um, compiler doesn't give you um, a default constructor, right? The reasoning is that, well, if you need a special constructor for this class, I, the compiler doesn't want to assume responsibility on what default constructor should do. So you have to do your own default constructor. And sometimes the default constructor might be a little bit tedious to, to write. And it's always very obvious to you what that default constructor should be. So you might say, well, the, the default constructor Y is the default constructor that you would do if there was not this, this constructor here. And this works many times and saves a lot of code too, because you don't have to replicate basically the same thing over and over again. <clears throat> you can also uh, delete constructors and delete any other member function actually. <coughs> so when you say, well, I need, I have my struct X, I use struct here. I mean, the reason why I use struct and not class in my example is, is because I don't want to write the uh, public access specifier every time, right? So I do struct so that everything is public. I can do my main, I can play with my code. Right? This is why I use struct in my example. Um, just to avoid writing and being putting too much into the slides to make them work. So if, for instance, I have a default constructor, well, I didn't have to actually put this sentence here, but I can say, I don't want the move assignment operator, for, for instance, right? For some reason, my struct X will not work well if I have the move assignment over, over operator. And in this way, what you do is, yeah, you delete it. So the compiler doesn't, doesn't see it. <clears throat> uh, okay, this is actually another, uh, another issue though, uh, with, the, with, with, the, with the C++ la language. So when, if you try to do this operation, you will get the compile error. This function has been deleted. Don't, you cannot use it. But then when I uh, create my <laughs> X, an object X, 
uh, of type X and an object Y, which is a copy constructor of this guy. You know that if I have uh, if if I have that my default constructors includes the copy constructor, but then if I define this one, this one it kind of is defining the move assignment as not there. So it's like you have defined your own. So in this case, the compiler will tell you, oh, you cannot call the copy constructor here because you have uh, delete, because there is a, the other one, the, the move assignment like here it is there. So I cannot do, I didn't make the copy constructor for you. Uh, and these are the different rules that you have to play along when you, when you want to de design your object with special semantics where it's not like a straight data type, it's not a simple data type uh, like an integer, uh, but you want your object to own resources and to do something special thing and having special semantics. In this case, the, uh, you have to be careful and know what the rules are for the automatic uh, function generation in C++. <clears throat> um, this is yeah, you can delete uh, every member function. The rules are these ones, right? The, the, the rules are here and uh, uh, you have the default constructor. If, if no other constructor is explicitly declared, you get the copy constructor. If there's no move constructor or move assignment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the uh, automatic generation of special member functions and those rules applies. <clears throat> Uh, let's go back a little bit to that example. Uh, so what are the default constructors? So the default constructors are um, basically what you would expect for a POD, for a plain old data type uh, struct in, in C, for, for, for instance. Uh, in this case, for instance, I'm using here a data uh, data member in, in initializer, which is also C plus plus eleven feature. The default constructor will set a to forty two. But if I didn't, I didn't put anything here. It would it would have been zero. Um, So in order to fix this example before, if I delete the uh, move assignment or, or, or operator, but I know that my default copy constructor will be just as fine because I'm doing, because it, my copy constructor will be the same as a, as a POD, then I can put my, my copy constructor as default. And in this way, my code now compiles and works as, as expected if I identify the right semantics. Right? If, if, if my semantics was defined right and this is what I wanted, this is exactly what I wanted to have. Um, the copy initialization uh, can move. Um, I don't know if I want to go into that, but uh, if, I'm, uh, if I'm copying if I'm if I have a type T, right, a class or a struct I call T, and I have a function that takes X, and I pass Y, I have an object Y of type T, then when I call F, I I do a copy construction of X. So X is taken from the copy construction of Y. So and if the Y is a big container, is it is a vector, for instance, then I copy the whole vector in. This will take a long time just because I need to copy the whole, the whole thing. But if I'm doing, if I'm constructing an object of type T in line to the function, that is actually constructed directly here. So it's not constructed here and then copied into X, but it just constructed into X. This is because T uh, curly brace is actually what is called expiring value. So after this function, T is not accessible. You cannot access this guy after here. And, and so you just, you just well constructed here anyway. 
this is where the semantics gets into uh, into into uh, play here because if you put the side effect into your constructor for instance you want to to know how many times an object is constructed or you want to print something or write something on a file on a constructor of an object and you want to say well i want i'm constructing the object here and then i'm copy constructing here so there's two constructions it actually turns out to be one constructor so you need to be careful when you want to uh move to, when you want to um, um what i was saying uh yeah, to, you don't want to put any side effects on your uh, on your constructors. <clears throat> uh, but then you can also uh, you can also move construct object. Uh, but this will come in when we talk about move semantics.